So, we've been learning about all of these types and different containers, but there's still not really that much that we can do with all of those. Do you feel entrapped in this not being able to do more with whatever you know right now? Don't worry, today we're gonna start changing this. And we start by introducing the control structures. They're called this way because they control how your code is executed. And these contain the if statement, so now you can execute the code if a certain condition is met, or else execute different code, and a different form of loops. So now you can execute code multiple times, which actually adds a lot to how you can program. If you've been watching the videos until now, then you already know how things go around here. Uh, so if you want, just stop the video right now and look at the slide on my left to check out all the symbols that I'm going to be using on the slides, but I won't stop right here to explain them again. And we start talking about the control structures by talking about an if statement. So the if statement is basically just that. It allows to execute a certain piece of code if a certain statement is true and uh, a different piece of code if it's not true. You can, you can kind of bunch them all together and you can call different if statements after an else statement of, uh, of your previous if statement and whatnot. So you can, you can pack them all together. You also don't have to use an else statement. So if you only have an if and you just do one action there, there is no need to use the else statement. And I keep saying statement, but what I really mean is it's something that evaluates to a Boolean expression. Um, for now, um, it can be any form of uh, different operations that lead up to a boolean variable or it can be a boolean variable itself. And uh, when we get to learning functions, this can be also a function that results in a boolean expression. Technically, you can also provide an int there and it will be converted to boolean. Basically, everything that is not zero will be a true and everything, well, the zero will be a false. But I wouldn't say this is a great idea. Try to avoid this, try to actually use boolean where boolean should be used. And again, technically you can omit the curly brackets that you see in the example above, but um, my personal preference is to always have the curly brackets, but I've met people who think differently. Generally speaking, if you are using Clang format, and you really should be using Clang format, then uh, um, your code will look differently if you make a mistake with like a missing curly bracket, for example, um, so, don't worry about that, do whatever you like there more. Um, I think nowadays the suggestion is uh, do whatever you please. But again, my personal preference is to always use curly brackets, even for a one-line statement. If is not a very long word, but if that's too long for you, you can use an even shorter notation. And this shorter notation is called a ternary operator. Um, I think it's best to explain it on an example. So if you look at the example on the slide here, uh, you can see that if we have some condition, we just uh, put a question mark after it and that basically defines our if statement and uh, whatever follows that question mark will be executed if our condition is true and then we have a, um, a colon and whatever is following that colon will be executed if our statement or if our condition is uh, false. Other than that, this is exactly equivalent to an if statement, so you can rewrite the example on the ternary, ternary operator as an if statement if you'd like to. Uh, generally speaking, if you have something that is extremely simple and you want to just have an inline operation, you can use a ternary operator, but for anything a bit more complex than that, I would probably suggest to use um, a, a full-blown if statement, if in doubt. Now, if you have a couple of predetermined paths, and you don't want to write the long if-else uh, clause, then uh, uh, you can use a switch statement. A switch statement does just that. It switches the uh, branch that you are going at, depending on the constant uh, that you know a priori. So if you have, uh, let's say, some number, which is, say, an integer, and we magically get it from somewhere, and we have a set of other integers which are stored in our constants, like const1 and const2, that we want to match that integer against. Uh, we could write an if statement. Let's say, if this number is equal to constant1, then do this, else do that, and, you know, you can just go to the slide before and understand how that one works. But if you don't want to write this repetitive if-else statements all, all over the, uh, the place, then you can use a switch statement which looks something like this. 
So you switch on your statement, which is at this point is just some input integer. And uh, in case this integer equals to constant one, you do this. In case it's equal to constant two, you do that. And it's usually a good idea to also have a default uh, case where if you forgot some constant, you will fall into that case. And that's where you usually do some form of an error handling. But technically speaking, it's not a must. So if you cover all of the cases that you want with the cases above, you don't really need a default statement right there. One thing to note here is that every case is uh, ending with a break. If you don't do this break, you will fall through to the next statement. And we'll talk about this on the next slide. And here we used an integer for the statement, but it can technically be any integer-like type. Uh, we haven't talked about enums yet. We will soon. It's not very complicated for now. Just think of it as you have to have enough values to actually use a switch statement. Now, I promised you that we would talk about omitting the break word. And when you omit the break word, you basically fall through down one level. So if I omit the break statement in my constant one case, then I will execute the constant one case, well, if I fall in that case in the first place, but then I will also execute the constant two case because I did not have a break there. Historically, this has been a great source of errors um, for many, many people and me included. Thankfully, in C++17, we now have an explicit attribute called fallthrough. And whenever we talk about an attribute in C++, we talk about something that is stored in this double square brackets. Um, so here, fallthrough is an attribute. And now we can annotate our case one with an attribute fallthrough. So now in our code, we know that if we hit this statement, it's not by mistake that we omitted the, uh, the break statement and we actually want to fall through. I think you will encounter many situations when you actually want this behavior and uh, this addition of this attribute is actually a very positive change. And this is it. These are uh, the two conditional structures that basically allow you to conditionally execute a certain piece of code or a different piece of code. And on this, we can move on executing your code multiple times. And we start with a while loop. Um, well, you might be familiar with the while loop from other different programming language that you might already know, uh, but it actually works, it, it's pretty simple. You have a while um, keyword, then after this keyword in the round brackets follows a statement and it can be anything uh, that evaluates to a bool. Uh, and while this evaluates to true, whatever um, is inside of the curly brackets that follow after that, uh, will be executed multiple times all over again. Just if we look at the example, let's say we have a Boolean condition and we set it to true and we update this condition by getting a random Boolean value. And at some point it's uh, basically like a coin flip, right? So at some point it will get to be false and then the while loop will stop and we get out of this while loop and continue the execution of whatever code follows our while loop. There is one more variation to the while loop and it's called a do while loop. The main difference is that it starts with the keyword do, then there follows stuff that we actually want to do, and then there is a while statement uh, in the end that checks if the condition still holds true. So that means that the first iteration will always, always run, regardless of what we do. And then only we check the condition to check should we stop or should we not. To be honest, this is used pretty rarely. There are some situations when you actually want this, but I don't want to go into details right here, right now. Um, at this point, it's enough that you know that it exists, uh, but most of the times you will just use the while loop from one slide before. Now, when you do know the number of your iterations, then you can use a for loop, which is uh, something that I use actually much more often than I use a while loop. The for loop is structured like this. So you have a keyword for, you have the initial condition where basically you initialize some variables. Then you have an end condition, which is a Boolean uh, statement, which has to evaluate to, uh, which evaluates to true. And when it stops evaluating to true, it stops the whole iteration. And then you have the increment um, of basically how do I move from one iteration to the next iteration. So if we look at an example for loop here, we see that we uh, initialize a variable i and we set it to zero. And then we want it to increment until it reaches the 
the iteration count and when it reaches the iteration count. So at the moment when it evaluates to equals iteration count, the iterations will stop. And whenever we go to the next iteration, we increment our, um, our variable that we want to increment, our index i. And you can use technically the postfix and the prefix notation here. If you don't know what those are, then uh, go to the link above this video and check it out in the fundamental types um, video. But um, usually just use the prefix notation as it's generally faster. Now, if you do come from languages, like especially scripting languages like uh, Python or maybe MATLAB, then uh, you might be aware that for loops might not be the best and might not be the fastest thing to uh, to use. So you would try to kind of form uh, different other things to avoid using a for loop. Uh, there is no need for this in C++. While there are things that you can do to your code to make it run even faster when you have a for loop, uh, generally speaking they are very fast, so we use them all the time. Now you might notice that we have to create this counter and we have to increment this counter and we have to do all of these things which are not really what we usually want to do with the for loop. We want to either call something a number of times or we want to call a certain piece of code on uh, every element of a certain container. And thankfully, since C++11, we have a way to express this intent much more precisely than uh, we can do with, with the previous version of for. And uh, here we are talking about the range for loop. Um, the name basically suggests uh, what it does. It iterates over a range of values and it still uses the for keyword. I really like this feature and I think in most of, of the use cases that I use for, I actually prefer to use the range for loop if I can um, and usually you can. So let's dive into how it works. It basically allows you to iterate over any container, at least any standard container, so something like an array or vector or a map even. Right, so let's look at an example. Let's say we have a vector of uh, integers and we want to iterate over every value in this vector of integers. We can use a ranged for loop here, um, where basically we uh, initialize a variable that we will use to store any value that we are iterating over, in this particular case we will call it a number and we'll have it a const uh, auto reference. Technically we could use just auto here or just const auto or just int or const int because we're storing int and generally speaking it's not the best idea to use the reference type when referring to small types like integers. But it's not a very big issue and for now I think we will just roll with uh, doing the reference there because that you can use with any type that you store in a vector. And we will talk about this when we start talking about how things are represented in memory. That's when you will understand why I'm, I'm, I'm talking like this right now. But for now we will stick with the const auto reference and now we create this const auto reference of a number and we then use the colon symbol and say we want this number to be taken from this numbers vector that we've just created. And now on every single iteration we will get the next number in our vector. How cool is that? I really like the syntax, it really expresses the intent well, um, so use that whenever you can. And the same holds for the map. We already looked at aggregate initialization before, uh, so it should not surprise you too much. Uh, if you don't know what, what I'm talking about, then uh, feel free to check out the video that I will leave in the description of this video and maybe link on the screen right now. But uh, generally what you see on the screen right now is that we create a variable, again, const auto, or actually two variables, the key and the value. And they will get assigned because whenever we iterate over a map, we iterate over pairs. And these pairs will then be automatically assigned to the key and the value that we have here. So this way you can print your whole map uh, to the terminal. You can also modify the data in your container uh, by omitting the constant just using the reference. So if you now take your um, values by a non-const reference and you change them, they will change within the container that you are iterating over. Try that on your own. Um, I will not do it on the slide here, but I really urge you to just fire up your editor, write a simple main function and in that main function create a certain container and try to modify values in it and then output them on screen. It will take you literally minutes and uh, you will get more and more used to actually coding in C++ 
uh, from scratch. Now, I've been talking about this a little bit before, but uh, now I want to talk about this explicitly. You can form endless loops, both with the while loop and with the for loop. Uh, when you're working with the while loop, then it's actually very easy and the intent is very clear. You just uh, say while true, do something, right? So it will never change. The true can never change because it's a constant. Um, but if you do something inside, um, it will always happen until the end of time or uh, until your program gets killed otherwise. You can do the same with the for loop by just basically omitting all the statements and it will do just the same. It will also loop infinitely many times um, and that's it. Um, I like while loop because it actually, if I read the code while true, I understand what it means. If I read the code that reads for and then two semicolons, I have no idea what that means. So I'd say prefer a while loop here. And if you are wondering, now that I have an endless loop, why would I ever need this? You generally need it to uh, run a certain thing over and over again. For example, if you're writing a game, you will need a game loop for waiting till your user inputs something. And you do that by creating a loop that constantly listens to what the user is about to input. And when the user inputs something, then your code starts processing it and does something with it. Right? So you're basically just waiting endlessly until that happens. And sometimes you do want to stop your endless loop in a certain situation. So in those situations, you can use uh, the keyword break, which will stop a loop. And if you got, for example, say some random value inside of your, uh, of your while loop, and let's say it's divisible by two, um, then you just want to continue to the next iteration, but let's say if it's not divisible by two, you can just stop the loop. And this is exactly what this example on the screen does right now. And with this, you know everything about the conditionals and the different loops uh, that you can do with C++. So now you can do much, much more with this. See you in the next one. Bye.